Okay, let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you for living understanding of this vision that you describe as the great vision. We ask you, Lord, that you would mark our hearts in the way that you marked Daniel with this vision pertaining to the events surrounding the generation of your son's return. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Daniel had four visions, and most of you, we have that down by now. I've said that over and over. And the uh, Daniel 7 is the first vision. Daniel 8 is the second. Daniel 9 is the third vision. But Daniel 10, 11, and 12, three entire chapters are dedicated to the final vision. And this vision is actually called in verse 8 a great vision. It had an unusual impact on Daniel and its meaning for the generation that the Lord returns. And so there's so much relevant information in this vision. Paragraph A, Dan, uh, Daniel 10, is the context. So we, we're going to see what Daniel was doing. He doesn't get the vision until actually chapter 11 and 12. So chapter 10 is what he's doing to position himself in order to receive the vision. And, and the vision he receives, Daniel 11 and 12, is the longest and most detailed prophetic vision in the whole Bible. It has to do with the Antichrist. It has to do with the Great Tribulation. It has to do with the ultimate victory of Israel and the saints over evil as well. It's a glorious uh, way to end the book of Daniel. Paragraph B. One of the things that's so remarkable about Daniel 10, and it's a favorite chapter to intercessors, you know, Lou, Lou Engel has told me, this is my favorite chapter in the whole Old Testament related to prayer because what happens is that God draws back the veil and he lets us see what is happening in the realm of the Spirit when we're offering our weak prayers on the earth. I mean, we offer our prayers in weakness. They ascend in power because of the blood of Jesus and because of the kindness of God. But our prayers, even Daniel's prayers, when he offered them, I, I assure you, he thought, oh, well, that was kind of a rough prayer meeting. But we can't imagine the impact that's happening in the realm of the Spirit when godly people pray. And that's what Daniel 10 does. It gives us a snapshot as to the impact and the effect in the realm of the Spirit. Daniel 10, I'm still in paragraph B, reveals the conflict between high-ranking angels and high-ranking demons. Now, over every city of the earth, there is a high-ranking angel that's representing God's purpose. But there's also a high-ranking demon over every city, over countries, and even smaller geographic units than that. And the, the conflict between the angels is dynamically related to the deeds of the people in that region. If the people are, are more involved in immorality, there is an empowering in the demonic realm for more spirits to be involved in, in, that, in that. So the demons incite more immorality, and the people that say yes, they invite the demons and give access to them, and so there's this dynamic tension between what the demons can do and what the people on the earth do. It's, it's like uh, the more sin, then the more access to the demonic realm and the more energizing the demons are. That's why it really matters that our cities repent and not just our family and a few of our friends. Because the whole city is affected by what happens in the city. But the same thing happens in the angelic realm. The deeds of the saints and the prayers of the saints. What I mean by deeds, acts of righteousness, lives committed to godliness. There is a relationship to our prayers and angels going forward. Now God the Father could just wave his hand and just dismiss the whole demonic kingdom and say, You're, I'm finished with you, but he doesn't do that. He says, "There's going to I'm going to release the angelic at a greater level related to the way my people on the earth claim the authority of Jesus and remind me of my promises and declare my word and ask me to break in in power. And so we don't see the angelic and demonic conflict, but it's happening. Right now in this room, there's plenty of angels, there's plenty of demons. And the angels hold back the demons, but the demons want to do more. It's all over the earth. If, the, if our eyes could see into the realm of the Spirit, we would be amazed 
is how much of the heavenly host, good and bad, is involved in the affairs of what's happening. One guy said, well, you don't want to see a demon under every, uh, you know, trash bin, you know. And I said, that's right, you don't. You don't want to see a, a, a demon under every trash bucket. You want to see two because there's two of them, not one. It's far more intensive than we imagine. I mean, honestly, we, we, really, we, 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 uh, we really minimize the truth of this. If we pray, more happens. If we pray, the angelic is more involved. If we don't pray, the angels are still there and still things happen because there's things that are going to happen anyway, but there's an increase of the glory of God, and that's what Daniel 10 is all about. So let's talk about political leaders because in a minute we're going to talk about the clash between the king of Persia and what's happening with the Jewish people. So there's a human king. And the human king, you know, he's just going on business as usual. All the presidents uh, of the nations, the kings, the prime ministers, the governors of states or provinces or whatever the title is, because there's different high-ranking uh, demonic and angelic related to the stature or the sphere of authority of the man or the woman in the, in the natural realm. So the king, you know, he's just thinking he's having a bad day, and he's thinking, he gets in a real bad mood. He's, ah, oh, today I'm just in a funk. And he doesn't know there's a demon breathing fire down on his mind, inciting him to anger. And he's just in this real uh, intense mood. So he makes laws and gives his decrees under the influence of demonic power that he doesn't even believe exists. He just thinks he's having a bad day, and he's fed up with people. And that's how it is. And at the key moment that he's making his legislation, that's when he's in that strange, heightened mood uh, that's negative. And I'm telling you, many times, there's demonic powers inciting that kind of feeling. The saints pray, and what happens? The angels drive back the demons, and that same ungodly king, all of a sudden, he's like, you know what, I just feel a little bit different today. And, and so he has his cabinet meeting, and... He has a whole different tone, a whole different posture. It says in Proverbs 21 that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it like channels of water. And all of a sudden we're praying. I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're praying, and all of a sudden an angel drives that demonic power back. Even the ungodly king just feels this kind of lightness. It's because of the prayers of the saints. It really matters if we, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, pray for those in authority. He goes, it will affect your lifestyle and your family and your economy. It really will because those ungodly men or women, believers or unbelievers, they are both affected by the angelic and a demonic in a way they don't understand and that the impact is dynamically related to the prayers of the saints. It's not only related to prayer, but prayer really does matter in the whole mix. Here we have in Ephesians chapter 6 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in, uh, in the heavenly places. That's who we're wrestling against. Okay, let's go to Roman numeral 3. Let's look at the context. In uh, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, In the third year of King Cyrus, or uh, he's king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel. And the message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. Now, Daniel at this time, he's in his mid-80s, and for those of you that have been to the earlier eight sessions, you know that uh, this is two years, 536 B.C. is the timing, it's two years after Persia has conquered the, the empire of Babylon, and the Jewish captives have been set free and liberated to go back to Jerusalem and to build the city of Jerusalem and to build the temple there. And so 50,000 of the Jewish captives have already gone back. And they're back in Jerusalem, and it's year one, and they're being resisted by everybody. I mean, they, you know, might have thought they were going to go back and it was just going to go good because God was sending them and his power was on them. But they had enemies at every turn. And so uh, uh, Daniel, it says here in paragraph B, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks, meaning he was praying, uh, fasting and prayer. I ate no pleasant food. I ate no meat, drank no, no wine, came into my mouth. 
nor did I anoint myself at all for three whole weeks till they were fulfilled. So he's mourning over the condition back in Jerusalem and the resistance and the uh, opposition that the Jewish uh, exiles, the, the, the newly liberated slaves are back in town. Uh, I mean, they've walked the, the four to five month journey back to Jerusalem from Babylon, which you know is modern day Iraq. So they do this long five month walk. They get there and it's it's trouble, 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 and there. And Daniel is go, receiving the report, and he says, "I'm laboring in prayer for you." That's the context. Top of page eighty-six. Well, Daniel goes on a fast, and I'm just uh, got a little bit here on the Daniel fast. We just went on a twenty-one day Daniel fast. Many of you did. I don't want to go through that again. Got a few details on that. Paragraph D, but I do want to say this. Fasting doesn't earn us anything, but it positions us to receive more from the Lord and to receive it quicker. If we fast, our heart is more sensitized, our heart is tender, we receive more and we receive it faster when we fast. And so that's really what's going on. We don't earn anything, but we position ourselves to receive more of what God wanted to give us all along. Roman numeral five. Daniel then suddenly, on the 21st day, here he is just praying and crying out, this mighty angel visits him. In verse 5 and, and 6 describe the angel. It says, and behold, a certain man, and often when an angel appears, they will, uh, the, the Old Testament will use the phrase a man because angels have a human appearance, although they have a radiance and they have different features as well. So this heavenly angelic being comes to him, and he notices his face is like lightning. So he knows it's not a man. He's just letting you, us know that there is, a, there is a, a resemblance, you know, arms, legs, face, eyes, mouth of angels to humans. Face like lightning. Can you imagine a being standing in your bedroom one night, late at night, you're saying, oh God, give me a visitation. You go to bed, and all of a sudden it, in the middle of the night, this angelic being with a face like lightning, it says, eyes like fire, staring right at you. It, I'll tell you, it'd it really wake you up. <laughs> Paragraph B, well, Daniel gives his uh, response. Now, be, uh, because of this mighty angel, this is a ma an angel of great stature. And the reason it's important to note this, because the stature of the angel speaks of the importance of the vision. Because the angel was a high-ranking angel, we know that the vision the angel's bringing is commensurate to the stature of the angel. Paragraph B, verse 7, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. The men with me, so he's got a, a team of, of men in this fasting and prayer mode with him. So I tell you, it's, it's, it's such a, a blessing to have marvelous comrades, those that will stand with you in the gap, that are kindred spirit, that have the same vision, the same values. I mean, so many in the body of Christ are finding arguments not to pray and fast. And they're saying, well, the grace of God, we don't need to do this, we don't need to do that, we don't need to do that. And they just live their life in spiritual barrenness, in spiritual boredom, claiming the grace of God. But there's a whole other group in the body of Christ. They're claiming the grace of God to empower them to be radically devoted to the Lord and to go as far as the Lord will allow them to go in the deep things of God. And Daniel had some guys around, some comrades of like spirit. Beloved, if you have a few people in your life that are in unity and they want to go deep and they want to go full blast and wholehearted with God, you are blessed among men or women. You're, you're blessed if you have three or four of them. Well, these men were with him. Now, Daniel sees the vision. The men don't see it. So his eyes are opened. He sees this angel lightning coming out of his face, fire coming out of his mouth. Sound like his voice was like the sound of many waters, just absolutely terrifying. Daniel, the men don't see the vision, but the terror of the Lord falls on the men. Now, look at this. They're having a prayer meeting. They're all in there in unity. The men run out of the prayer meeting. They don't see anything. Ah! They just start running. 
Because the terror of the Lord, that wonderful, glorious, terrifying sense of the weightiness of the presence of the mighty God. I believe that this Old Testament uh, uh, episode in Daniel's life is a picture of the kind of prayer meetings and angelic encounters are going to be happening more and more as we approach the coming of the Lord. I don't think that the angel that delivers the message is going to be more powerful or mighty than the angels that visit when the message is fulfilled. I mean, if the giving of the message is this mighty, what is the walking out in the nations of this message going to look like? I believe there will be men and women that have the heart of Daniel, the radical commitment to prayer. They will fast. They will lay hold of the word. There will be people of understanding. And there will be angelic visitations that will be of this level and even greater because the fulfillment is greater than the promise. I mean, what, do you, what would you rather have, the promise, or would you rather have the fulfillment of the promise? Well, the fulfillment has a greater manifestation of power. Well, he goes on in verse 8 and describes the great vision. And he calls it in verse 8, I saw this great vision. Now, he's had four, but this is the one he calls the great vision, which is interesting. That, that he identifies this one of the four, and he doesn't mention this. Describe the other three like this. He said, I had no strength in me. My vigor. I lost my strength and my vigor, etc. Okay, let's go to top of page uh, 87 in the syllabus, in the teaching notes. Okay, so now the mighty angel comes in response to Daniel's prayer. So the angel with a face like lightning and eyes like fire, verse 11, he says to me, I mean the shock of his life, he's trembling, he has no strength, he's on his face, it says in verse 8, he's completely overcome by the majesty of God. The angel says, oh, greatly beloved. I mean, what a statement. Can you imagine a high-ranking angel straight from the Father's presence coming to say, before I give you the message, the Father wants you to know this. You, in a particular way, not just in a general love of God message, you are greatly beloved to your God. He is moved by the way that you live. He's moved by your hunger for him. His heart is moved by your lifestyle choices to be in agreement with his word and his purpose. He's moved by the way that you're moved by him. And when it says that you're greatly beloved, we know that God so loved the world. God loves every human being, believer and unbeliever. But God does not enjoy the relationship of the people out of the world. He loves them, but he doesn't enjoy relationship with him. But there are those in the body of Christ, he enjoys us in relationship, but there are those that God takes special delight in the choices they make, and he takes special delight in their communication they have with him. And in this sense, it's a unique sense, it's a different sense, that God loves the world, even though they reject it, he loves the whole body of Christ, but he has great enjoyment over those that with all of their heart are seeking to obey the Lord in the way that Daniel did. And so the angel says, understand the words that I speak to you. Verse 12, this is a very important point. He says, from the very first day, 21 days ago, you set your heart to understand what the purpose of God was for the saints back in Jerusalem. Because they, the 50,000 had left uh, about a year earlier, and they have arrived in Jerusalem, and they're, and they're having trouble, and... and, and, and uh, Daniel's saying, Lord, you promised in my third vision, the one that we looked at earlier today, you promised you would restore Jerusalem, you'd restore the temple, and, and, and it's not, it, there's resistance, and things aren't going in the way that we wanted them to go, and, and there's, there's resistance and there's setbacks. And so uh, Daniel was crying out to God, and the Lord says this, he says, from the very first day, that you set your heart to understand what I'm doing and what the resistance was, to understand what my will was in the matter, and from the very first day that you humbled your heart. Fasting is a statement of humility, because we're taking legitimate 
pleasures of life that are godly legitimate, we're laying them aside to position ourselves to receive more, to go deeper, quicker, and the Lord calls that humility. He says that my purpose is more important to you than just your routine of life. God says that is called humility in my presence and in my sight. But notice that it was from the very first day. From the very first day that Daniel began to pray, 21 days later, the angel said, I heard you. And I just can't hardly imagine the, the, this next phrase in, chapter tw- in verse 12. He says, I've come because of your words. And the, the meaning is clear. If you would not have prayed and fasted, I would not have come. Beloved, there is a dynamic relationship between what we do and how God visits us. We don't earn it. You can't earn God, but, I mean, earn anything from God by skipping a meal. But you can position yourself in unity with his heart and declare to him the hunger of your heart. And he says, I'll give you on the basis of hunger. You don't earn it just because you're hungry, but you value the things that I value, and that matters to me. He says, I've come because of your words. In other words, if you would not have prayed, I would not have come. Verse 13, now here's this really unusual uh, uh, verse here. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, he withstood me for 21 days. And Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. I mean, what an unusual verse. Verse 13 gives us insight what's happening in the realm of the Spirit. Now, when he says the prince of Persia, there's a human prince and there's a demonic prince. The demonic prince in the New Testament, they're called principalities. They're the highest ranking demonic powers. And Daniel's talking about the demonic principality over the king of of Persia. He's not talking about the king himself himself. But rather, he's talking about the enemy that's once, I mean, the demon that wants to inspire that king. Now, that king is King Cyrus, by the way, just just so you know. He was the king that liberated the Jewish people to go back, that actually had a heart for the things of God. But even though he has a heart for God, the demonic power over him was wanting him to shift his policies and to shift his moods and to shift his his, uh, perception of what's going on in the nation of Israel. He goes, well, the demonic power, this mighty angel with a face like lightning, eyes like fire, he goes, this very powerful demon stood against me for 21 days. He goes, on day one, when you fasted, I came to you. The father was moved, and he said, go, and I came, but this demonic power, he resisted me, and he resisted me, and it's like the Lord said to the mighty angel, if Daniel keeps praying, keep pressing in. Daniel stops praying, it's over. If he keeps praying, keep pressing and stay resolved. And so this angel's doing it, but this principality is mighty, and he's strong, and he's high-ranking. You say, well, what about the authority of Jesus? Well, the authority of Jesus is why the the, the mighty angel has power, and it's why our prayers are effective. But the authority of Jesus is manifest with people who persevere in obedience and prayer because the Lord wants partnership with us. He says, I can do it without you. I just don't want to. I so care for the relationship. I'm going to do it with you. And I will do it to the degree you hunger for me to do it. And if you don't hunger hunger for me to do it, I won't do as much. If you hunger for more, I'll do more. Beloved, settle the issue, and many of you have. It really matters if we pray and fast and obey and press in when nobody's looking. It really, really matters in the grace of God. The grace of God doesn't, Jesus doesn't fast and pray for us. He doesn't pay our taxes. He doesn't mow our lawn. He doesn't humble us, humble himself so that we don't have to. What Jesus did empowers us to do, to obey with all of our heart. And that's what the grace of God does. Well, this prince came. And Michael, one of the chief princes, this is clearly an archangel. This is not just a a human Israeli prince, but this is the archangel. He came to help me. So this mighty angel's resisting. He's, he's pressing in to come to touch Daniel, to give him understanding. This prince of Persia, which is, by the way, the, prince, the same nation as Iran, 
And by the way, that same demon that was over uh, uh, Persia years ago, 2,500 years ago in, this, in Daniel 10, that same principality is operating in power in Iran today. It's the same one, and it's going to be the same response of a corporate Daniel praying for the angelic to break through in a greater force that regions of the earth are actually shifted by the prayers of the saints. It's going to be... We're not just seeing how amazing Daniel's one experiences, uh, uh, experience was. We actually are getting a model of what God wants to drive the prince, the principality of Iran, Iraq, Syria, to drive them back from uh, wanting to disrupt the purposes of God in Israel and beyond Israel as well. Israel is their chief focus, but they have other things on their mind Besides Israel, though, that's the primary thing they're coming against. They want to disrupt the kingdom in any way that they can. So this mighty angel tells Daniel, I mean, Daniel, he's just overcome this, like, uh, tremendous experience. God just said, I love you. You're so beloved to me. And he's recovering. And he says, Michael the archangel is helping me. That's why I broke through. But if you wouldn't have prayed, I would not have come. And if you would not have prayed, Michael would not have come. If you would have drawn back, you would have had business as usual, and you wouldn't have had the visitation. Again, we don't earn it, but that participation with God matters to God. Don't let anybody steal that truth from your heart, because there's so many voices today wanting to take that fervency out of believers in the name of just chill out and lay back and do what you want to do in the grace of God. I mean, it's already done for you. I mean, let boys be boys, and hey, let life, isn't life fun? We're in the middle of a war. The nations of the earth are in a war zone right now, and God's looking for mighty men and women with the dedication of Daniel to posture themselves before him in the way that Daniel did. Well, he came to help, and now the angel says this, verse 13, he goes, I had been left alone. Like, what? He wasn't saying, I, I feel a little bit rejected, I'm alone, nobody will talk to me. That's not what he's talking about. He says, I don't have the assistance of another high-ranking angel. I'm the only high-ranking angel in the battle, but your prayers, the Father, the Ancient of Days, he gave the nod, and Michael came to help as well because you stayed with it. He goes, and now with two high-ranking angels, we can overpower the Principality of Persia. I mean, what a remarkable insight. I mean, it's, it's ever so brief, but the implications are so significant and they're so important. Now verse 14 he says, I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people. He goes, I've come to give you understanding of why things are being disturbed over in Israel. I want you to see God's big picture, and I want you to see the conflict in the realm of the spirit that's causing the resistance. And he says, but what's really I want you to see is not just the temporary conflict right now. I want you to see the big picture of what's going to happen at the end of the age because the conflict is going to escalate. The closer we get to the Lord's return, the more the prince of Babylon, which is that demonic power over uh, Iraq, the prince of Persia, the demonic power over Iran, the prince of Syria, over Egypt, over Saudi Arabia, the Middle East demonic powers, but there are Middle East angelic powers as well. Remember that? And Jesus is captain of the armies of heaven. He's captain over all of them. And again, we would prefer that Jesus waved his hand and everybody bad left and everybody just got happy, but it doesn't happen that way. He goes, no, no, no. I want your dynamic involvement with me. We're doing this in partnership together. Okay, let's go down to uh, paragraph F. I want to touch this, uh, this issue of being greatly beloved for just one more moment. I already mentioned God so loves the world. He doesn't enjoy relationship with the unbelievers, but he does love them and he's pursuing them. God enjoys all of his people. Because of the gift of righteousness in Jesus, we have access to him. And because we have a yes in our spirit, we're pursuing him. But God has a profound enjoyment of those that follow through in their obedience to him. It moves him that they care so much about the will of God in God's heart. And so that's what God is telling Daniel. I am especially moved by the way that you're moved for my concern and my glory and who I am. That touches me. 
Now, Jesus said the same thing in John 14, verse 21. It's a little bit mysterious at, at first reading. You think, how could this be? He says, he that has my commandments and keeps them, this is the person who loves me. Then he goes on and he says, the person who loves me will be loved by my Father. And not only that, I will love that person. So at a quick reading, you said, wait. That sounds like you only love us if we love you. But the Bible says you love us first, and then that awakens us to love you back. What? Jesus. I mean, you realize Jesus knows the Bible real well, right? So he's not contradicting the Bible. Jesus is not talking about just the, that glorious introductory reality to the love of God. He's talking about a more specific thing here. He says, if you obey me, that means you love me. If you love me at that kind of level, you will move the heart of the Father because he will love your choices. He will love the way you value the relationship. It will matter to him. It matters to him that he matters so much to you. That's what he's saying right here. And then he goes on to say, and Jesus says in verse 21, me and my father, we will manifest ourselves to you. And that's what we're seeing here with Daniel. They are, because God's saying in essence, Daniel, you don't deserve a glorious experience, but if you care that much about me, this experience, you will walk through it for my glory and for all the right reasons you were steward this experience. Some people just want an experience because they want to move on from a little spiritual boredom. They think, it would just be so cool to have an angel appear and things get a little lively and my life wouldn't be so bored. Well, Daniel's far past that mindset. He wants a manifestation of God because it will empower him to obey more and cooperate more. And so that's what Jesus is talking about here. 